In case you are joining us for the first time or you need a refresher, we are in the middle of a series of road trips with Paul. We've been traveling with him as he writes letters and visits newly forming communities of Christians in order to teach, encourage, and challenge them to allow the gospel to really shape every aspect of their lives. So as we roll down the windows on this road trip, I hope we'll feel the fresh wind of God's Holy Spirit that will help us not only better understand what life was like for the early Christians, but that we'll find in that some new clarity and passion for living out our faith too. Let's pray. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Today we are picking up with Paul on his second road trip or missionary journey. He's taken the exit for Corinth and has decided to stay a while. So in between making new friends, shout out to Priscilla and Aquila, and setting up his pop-up shop making tents, I think REI better watch out for him, he starts writing a letter to the Christian community at Thessalonica. Thessalonica was prime real estate for the Mediterranean world of that day. It was situated on the Via Ignatia, which was the major land route between east and west. So it was prime positioning for anybody and everybody trying to make a living. The city was predominantly Greek, but there was a pretty large influx of immigrants coming in to make Thessalonica their new home from all over the world. So really, the city was becoming this mashup of cultures, languages, philosophies, and food. Paul and his friends Silas and Timothy had road tripped to Thessalonica recently, and Acts chapter 17 tells us a little bit about their experiences there. How the Christian community was formed when a handful of Jews, a pretty good number of Greek-speaking, uh, God-fearing people, and several predominant women in leadership in the city got together. And so they formed this church, but at some point along the way, some in the Jewish community became pretty jealous of the traction that these young Christians were getting. So much so that eventually they whipped up this mob who dragged some of the Christians before the city leaders, shouting accusingly, these people are turning the world upside down. Wow. Something about the message of the gospel and something about the way these Christians were living out their faith was turning the world upside down. This was no polite, constrained, culturally acceptable way to spend a Sunday morning. This was shocking, transforming the very fabric of society, the very order of the world. Some people found this inspiring, but others found it threatening. Well, Paul and his friends continued on their road trip after this so they could plant some more churches and encourage other Christians along the way. But Paul could never forget this community in Thessalonica. So when he heard that they were struggling with people in the city who were trying to distract them, disunify them, and discourage them, he decided it was time to write a letter to encourage and remind them about what it really means to be the church, to embody the gospel. The gospel. Gospel is such a churchy word, isn't it? We say it a lot, but what do we really mean by it? Well, the Greeks used the word gospel to describe news of victory in battle. So for them, the gospel meant a messenger coming, face shining, spear decked with laurel, head crowned, swinging palm branches and calling out the good news so loudly that the whole city could hear it. The battle is won. For the rabbinic Jews, 
gospel referred to the message that plays like variations on a musical theme throughout the part of the scriptural story that we call the Old Testament. Telling of the God who created us in God's image. The God who gave us free will to choose how we will live the lives that God has gifted us. God who wants nothing more than to be in covenant relationship with us and who will stop at nothing to make sure that that relationship is not only possible, but lasting. In the New Testament, the gospel comes to take on an even deeper meaning still when it refers to Jesus Christ and the message that he both embodies as the Son of God and teaches in his life. The gospel in the New Testament is proclaimed by missionaries and musicians, by financiers and fishermen, by angels and thieves, by pregnant women and the poor. We learn that the gospel from Jesus is for all people. It is everywhere at work. It brings new life, it heals, it restores trust, it offers connection, relationship, and belonging. It rescues, liberates, and sets things right. It blesses those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who mourn. The gospel brings hope. It is entirely unique. It feels like the tight embrace and the extravagant welcome home after a long time away. It sounds like the quiet calm after a storm. It smells like a newborn lying in a feeding trough. It tastes like fresh baked bread. It looks like a group of tenacious toddlers clamoring to climb on Jesus' lap. The gospel is good news that is meant to infuse every fiber of our being to resound to the depths of our souls. The gospel is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God with us, in it all, for us all, for love of us all. That's the gospel. And so as Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he reminds them and us how to share it. We share it, Paul says in verse 2, with courage in God. Courage in God in God. I think that part of the phrase is critical because Paul is not here giving us a pop culture reference to the Wizard of Oz, nor is he giving us a mildly interesting TED talk to digest on our drive home from work. Paul is trying to tell us something critical about where our courage comes from and who it is rooted in. Come what may, in any and every context we find ourselves in. For Christians in part of the world that has for the past 2,000 years faced intense persecution, literally life and death, courage in God may look a certain way. And for us who live in America today, in Texas today, courage in God may look a little different. It may look like a willingness to remain non-defensive when criticized about core truths. It may look like a willingness and ability to listen with a gracious and generous spirit to those with whom we disagree. It may look like a tenacity in advocating for those who do not have a voice. It may look like a willingness to work alongside those who are new to us or those who are different than us. We share the gospel with courage in our God. 
We share the gospel from the motivation to please God, Paul says in verse 4. Please God. How do we know if we're pleasing God? Well, when Jesus was baptized, you may remember there was a voice from heaven that said, you are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Before he did any miracles, before he taught any parables, before he calmed storms or fed thousands, before he healed the sick and restored people to community, before he forgave sins or went to the cross, God called Jesus beloved. God said, with you, I am well pleased. Jesus' very being is what pleased God. And the same is true for me and you. God is pleased with you, not by what you do, but for who you are. And so, our desire to share the gospel comes out of a motivation to live out of that belovedness, to live out of that pleasure that we bring God just by our very being. And our desire that everyone will come to experience that identity and worth as God's beloved people for who they are. We share the gospel out of a sense of our belovedness. We share the gospel with integrity. An integrity that comes as we allow God to keep working in us every day. Paul talks about this in verses four and five of our passage where he says, God tests our hearts. God is our witness. In the 1500s, St. Ignatius of Loyola developed a way of intentionally making space for us to bring ourselves to this examining work of God's presence in our lives. We call that the daily examen. You may have heard of it before, maybe not. Here's kind of the basic gist of it. At the end of each day, we spend a little bit of time reviewing the day in God's presence. We think back over what happened and we thank God for the good moments. And we ask God for help to recognize the moments that were hard, painful, confusing, or where we just were getting it plain wrong. We ask for God's help to work on the hard and confusing stuff with us. We ask for God's healing for the painful moments. We ask for God's forgiveness and grace for the moments where we sin and miss the mark. And we ask for God's wisdom to make different decisions tomorrow. No matter how little or how long we've been in relationship with Jesus, We are in daily need of this rhythm of confessing, repenting, and receiving God's forgiveness, love, and grace. Practices like the daily examen keep us truly humble and very aware that as we try to share the gospel, we're doing so on the same playing field that everybody we encounter, all of us are all sinners in need of a savior and that our integrity plays an important part in whether people will believe the gospel we are sharing is real and whether they'll believe that it really is good news. We share the gospel in integrity. We share the gospel in relationship. Paul says it this way in verse 7. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. We cared for you. Paul employs a very rare Greek word here, one that describes the kind of caring that comes from an intense longing, a feeling of being drawn to something or someone. 
So this imagery that Paul uses here of a nursing mother caring for her children in this way offers us some insight around the tenderness and the vulnerability that is involved when we share the gospel in relationship. This tenderness is not coercive, but it comes alongside. It's not manipulative, it's invitational. It's not judgmental, it's compassionate. And this vulnerability is what enables us to be real about the ways that we are constantly stumbling (laughs) and growing in our faith. In case a metaphor of a nursing mother is not relatable to us, though, or in case we've just simply rushed on past it, Paul makes the same point in verse 8 of our passage with slightly different words. He says, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Friends, when we tap into this We're tapping into the heart of our God, the God who cares for us so much, that intense longing for us, drawing him to us, sent Jesus, his only son, to be Emmanuel, God with us through it all, through it all. We make that sound very general sometimes, I think, but Jesus really shared life in some concrete ways, like around the dinner table and at a wedding reception, by a graveside and a well, on the beach and in the mountains. He taught us what God's kingdom was like by telling stories of all things. He engaged people in conversations on hikes and fishing trips, on snack breaks and in the middle of a mundane work day, and even at the edge of desperation. He listened to and he shared everything from anxiety to joy, grief to healing, doubt to faith, ostracization to belonging. When one of the religious leaders asked Jesus what the most important commandment was, you may remember how he answered. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So apparently, loving God, ourselves, and our neighbors involves every aspect of who we are, every part of our life. So just as God is present with us in every moment of our lives, God is calling us to share life with people in ways that point them to how God is with them in every moment of their life too. And so that means for us showing up on the ball field and in the hospital room, on the pickleball court and in the courtroom, at the dinner table and in the carpool line, in the online gaming platform, and at the HOA meeting, in the struggle with infertility, and in the grappling with getting older, in the battle with loneliness, and in the wrestling with codependency, in the never-ending cycle of meal prepping, planning, and cooking, and in the struggle with trying to manage chronic pain on the playground and in the nursing home, in person and via text message. There's a line in one of our United Methodist liturgies for baptism where parents or guardians of children or those who are unable to answer for themselves vow that they will, quote, live before these children or persons a life that reveals the gospel. A life that reveals the gospel. I became a Christian in part because there were people who shared life with me 
in ways that revealed to me the gospel, ways that made the gospel personal, transformative. I continue to be a Christian. I continue to be a part of the church today in part because there are people in my life now who are sharing life with me in ways that are reminding me, inspiring me, and challenging me to come back, to come back to the God who calls me beloved, to come back to the God who longs to share every part of life with me, to come back to the God who invites me to share life with with those who have never heard and those who have forgotten. With those who have become turned off to faith because of hypocrisy and those who are looking for a long obedience in the same direction. With those who have longed to have a safe space to wrestle with honest questions and those battling daily with anxiety and depression with those who feel worthless, unseen, or unheard, with those who don't feel deserving of love, with those who are struggling just to get through today, and those who are already rushing on ahead to next week's plans as we speak, with those who are going through the motions of faith out of some sense of obligation, and those who are unsure how to live in the tension of doubt and faith. With those who are too busy to think and those who think the gospel isn't true. In verse four, Paul reminds us that God has entrusted the gospel to us. Paul is in tr- God has entrusted the gospel to us. And so I hope that we will with courage in our God, with a motivation to live out of God's love for us as we are, by allowing God to continually work within us with a gentleness, a vulnerability, a tenderness, of relationship, we will do this. We will choose to share the gospel, the grounding of our faith, the expression of our hope, the source of our joy, the good news that God is always with us. Let us pray. God, we thank you for reminding us today what the gospel is all about and for inviting us, really challenging us, to share this good news by sharing life with those around us. We are in awe that you would trust us with this incredible privilege. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear that you're with us in every moment. And fill us, Holy Spirit, with your unique blend of empowerment in the courage, accountability, tenderness, and vulnerability that we can live lives that reveal the gospel. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.